there were those who said that man would never fly. Those who gazed into the heavens and said that we would never walk on the moon. Others who wondered why anyone would need a computer in their home. And the many who couldn't imagine a world not connected by wires. History is full of visionaries who encountered naysayers, doubters, and disbelievers. Those who sought out their own paths and followed their dreams. And while others stood still, they moved forward. Today there are those who believe that energy cannot be clean and affordable. That we cannot meet the needs of everyone, everywhere. But with conviction, invention, and perseverance, we can do amazing things. Our visions can be realized. Our problems can be solved. We can change the face of energy. We can change the world. Good morning, everyone. I'm Pat Harker, and it's up to me to follow early aviation, a moon landing, Einstein, and Dr. King. Uh, I'll give it a shot. I am thrilled to welcome you all to the University of Delaware for this historic event. This morning, we formally break ground on the Bloom Energy Manufacturing Center, the California company's first East Coast facility. Without doubt, today is a celebration of many things we cherish as a community, clean energy leadership, economic development that marries cutting edge science and technology with a strong manufacturing base, good jobs for hardworking Delawareans, an abiding commitment to discovery, invention, and innovation as the way forward. Today's agenda is tightly packed with a lot of people, but that's how it should be, because there were a lot of people involved in bringing Bloom to Delaware, and I'd like to acknowledge just a few of them right now. K.R. Schreeder, principal co-founder and CEO of Bloom Energy, he launched an amazing company 11 years ago, and he's now brought it right here to Delaware. Welcome. Both moves required vision, courage, and faith, and we couldn't be happier to have him and Bloom Energy here in the first state. Governor Markell is all about the first state, and it was his undeniab undeniably his determination to make this deal happen that brought us to this campus today. The governor's entire administration backed this project from the beginning, and the hard work of a lot of people has paid off, and they deserve a round of applause. <laughs> Delaware's congressional delegation, Senator Tom Carper, Senator Chris Coons, and Representative John Carney, understand better than anyone what makes Delaware special and why it pays to do business here. Their persuasive support of this project is deeply appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. <laughs> I'm equally grateful for the support of Delaware's General Assembly. We have many legislators in the audience today whose to the mat advocacy of this manufacturing center made it a reality. Thanks for all your efforts on our behalf. Newark Mayor Vance Funk. I know there's another Funk working for Bloom, so they were trading um, histories. They, Newark Mayor Vance Funk knows a good deal when he sees one. He knows his constituency, he knows his city, and he knows what's going to benefit both. Thank you for championing this project as well. Joe Rigby, President and CEO of, Pep, uh, CEO of Pepco Holdings, and Gary Stockbridge, President of Delmarva Power, partnered with the state to bring Bloom East and to bring Delawareans clean, reliable energy. Thanks for all your support. <laughs> the extraordinary contributions of these and so many other people explain the success that we are here gathered to celebrate this morning. I want to talk just briefly about one more contribution and that's the land that we are sitting or standing on right now. 
This is the University of Delaware Science, Technology, and Advanced Research Campus, our STAR campus. And by the way, this is the first time I've used its new name in public. We bought this land from the Chrysler Corporation in 2009, always with the vision to transform it into a place where the most creative, the most innovative, the most industrious people would come together to reimagine what's possible, to harness our shared knowledge, talent, and experience, and redesign the way America thinks and works. This end goal, higher education for the public good, goes to the very heart of our mission. The University of Delaware is a land-grant university. And with land-grant universities across the country, this year we celebrate the 150th anniversary of our charter. Justin Morrill's Land Grant Act of 1862, signed by President Lincoln, opened access to higher education. It connected citizens with the knowledge, research, and resources that support community and economic development. In terms of strengthening a young nation's democracy and prosperity, it remains one of the most important pieces of legislation ever passed. This star campus is our land grant mission in action. This is where we'll join our efforts with Bloom Energy and with many academic and industry partners to serve the public with practical research and important innovations, where we'll deploy our creativity and our inventiveness to solve the most persistent problems that challenge our local and our global communities. And I couldn't be happier that Bloom Energy, our very first star campus tenant, is with us in this pursuit. There's enormous benefit to be gained from this partnership, and we can't wait to get started. It's now my honor to introduce the architect of this deal, Governor Jack Markell. We're here because of Governor Markell's relentless drive to bring Bloom Energy to Delaware, to secure hundreds of jobs for Delawareans who need them, and to prove that the first state is the state to do business. Congratulations, Governor Markell. This is an extraordinary moment, and I want to thank you for making it happen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Well, it is, uh, it's wonderful uh, to be here. Uh, President Harker, thank you for the introduction. Thank you for your extraordinary uh, leadership here at the university and, and certainly uh, all the help with this particular uh, great opportunity for Delaware. I'm really uh, happy that my wife, Carla, the First Lady of Delaware, uh, has joined us today. So Carla, thank you for, uh, for, thank you for being here. Um, President Harker mentioned a lot of people by name, uh, and I'm not going to repeat all that, but I do want to uh, uh, acknowledge all the folks uh, from the congressional delegation and, and from Delmarva and all the specific people that he did uh, mention, and of course KR, but there are a couple people that I also want to point out. Uh, the President mentioned the General Assembly, and I'm not going to mention every member of the General Assembly who is here, but I can tell each of you that I'm extraordinarily grateful. Uh, not just for your being here, but more importantly for the hard work that you put in last year uh, to make today possible. And uh, specifically, I want to mention the President Pro Tem of the State Senate, Tony DeLuca, the Speaker of our House, uh, Bob Gilligan. I also want to thank uh, Harris McDowell and uh, Daryl Scott, Senator McDowell and Representative Scott, who accompanied a number of us when we went to uh, Bloom's uh, headquarters last year uh, on our own due diligence trip. So to all of them, please, thank you so much. I also want to thank another member of that trip uh, was uh, Jim Wolf of the State Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Jim uh, uh, flew out with us, and uh, we really appreciate uh, your, your, your participation, your work, and your leadership. And I want to thank a number of people uh, from my administration who just uh, did incredible uh, work on this, and specifically that's uh, Secretary Colin O'Mara uh, from Department of Natural Resources, the Director of the Economic Development Office, uh, Alan Levin. Uh, Bernice Whaley, uh, who's a deputy in, in, in uh, the Economic Development uh, Office, and amongst many people in the Governor's Office, uh, Jeff, Sor Jeff Sawyer, and they all just did an extraordinary job, so thanks to all of them as well. And on the, uh, the Bloom team, there are many, many members of the Bloom team, uh, and I hope that I will not get him in any trouble, but I do want to uh, particularly thank uh, Josh Richmond. Uh, yes. Um, uh, Josh uh, spent an incredible amount of time uh, here in Delaware during, I, I don't know how many, at least a dozen, probably more, probably 18 
uh, trips. He actually contributed a lot to our economy. We, th we appreciate that. Uh, but we're, we're glad this all came to, uh, to fruition. Um, you know, for generations, the, the Chrysler plant uh, that used to be right here uh, built ca cars uh, that powered down our, our nation's highways. And blocks away, uh, the University of Delaware built on its campus generation after generation of inno innovation and innovators uh, to help power our nation's economy as well. Now, I grew up just down Kirkwood Highway, literally a couple miles uh, from here, and I remember how critical the jobs that were here at Chrysler were uh, to so many of my neighbors, uh, to, to their families. Um, and after the Chrysler plant closed at the end of 2008, uh, people started to ask out loud whether our best days uh, were behind us, whether Delaware uh, might lack the promise and potential, the Delaware of today might lack the promise and potential of the Delaware where so many of us grew up. Uh, some said that it was a good run, but they also said that that run was over. Well, we refused to accept that answer, and I am a, a, so, so grateful uh, to the members of our congressional delegation, Senator Carper and Senator Coons and Congressman Carney, who every step of the way have been right there with me and with the members of the General Assembly in refusing to accept that answer. And along the way, the university uh, acquired this plant thanks to the tremendous vision and implementation of Pat Harker. And as he mentioned today, it's for the science and technology and advanced research campus to put people to work right here on research and education. And at the same time, we knew that Delaware had so much to offer, and we refused to accept, as I mentioned, that Delaware's days of making things and providing high-quality and middle-class manufacturing jobs uh, were over. So we started looking. For somebody as committed to growth, as ready to embrace the future of manufacturing uh, and commerce as we were. The process was hard, uh, but the goal, frankly, was simple. We wanted to build here again uh, and uh, hundreds of middle class good careers. And Bloom Energy uh, was an obvious choice to try and recruit uh, here to Delaware. Bloom is an American company, and they're experiencing real growth. They've got some of the nation's most recognizable uh, brand names as, as customers. Uh, places like Google and Bank of America and Coca-Cola and eBay and FedEx and uh, Staples and Walmart, all using Bloom Energy uh, to power their businesses. And you're going to get a chance to meet some of these and some new customers uh, today. And they told us that the demand for their energy servers, which is sitting right there, this is one of them, if, in case you missed it when you came in, this, that, that's it. Uh, that the demand was growing quickly. Uh, they needed to build a manufacturing facility somewhere here on the East Coast, and it was a factory that could put hundreds of people to work uh, to serve this growing roster uh, of customers. They were going to build it somewhere, and we were determined that they build it here because Delaware is a small state with big ideas and with huge potential. And we told them, we spent lots of time with Josh and with KR and Bill Kurtz and so many of the Bloom uh, people. We talked about Delaware's fantastic workforce, our great schools, our very responsive government. And our unshakable commitment, probably more important than anything else, was our unshakable commitment uh, to get the people of Delaware back to work. And we made clear that we would pull together. And so many, including so many of the people here, uh, did just that. Uh, the, 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 the General Assembly uh, just did an, an incredible job. Our, our, our two senators both flew uh, to California. Uh, to, to see Bloom uh, in person, to see the factory, to meet the people uh, in person, as well as to talk specifically uh, with, uh, with KR. So this factory uh, should give hundreds of uh, Delawareans uh, the, the chance to put their energy into manufacturing products that, are going, that will power homes and businesses uh, across, all up and down the East Coast. And it really combines the legacy of quality construction that marked this site for decades under Chrysler with this new legacy of research and development and innovation that is going to emerge from this star campus, science, technology, and advanced research campus. That creates a win-win scenario for everybody. You know, growing up, I went to school each day you know, with kids whose parents were proud of the hard work that they did right here on this campus, building things in Delaware that could be exported all over the world. And today's groundbreaking gives new energy and new opportunity to a new generation of kids Whose, whose parents are going to be proud to write that next chapter of what it means to be made in Delaware. And we, <laughs> we 
And with that, I have the opportunity to, uh, to introduce the person that all of you really wanted to meet and, and to hear from. Uh, K.R. Sridhar uh, is just an, an, an incredible... <clears throat> <clears throat> it's not that I'm getting choked up, K.R. <clears throat> K.R. Is, um, is a great uh, entrepreneur, uh, a visionary, but he understands uh, that uh, one of my favorite lines, that vision without the ability to execute is just an hallucination. And he, is, and he has created uh, a tremendous team at Bloom Energy, uh, and we are so excited that uh, Bloom is going to be right here, an important part of the Delaware economy. K.R., thank you so much. Good morning. I'm very thrilled and excited to be here in Delaware today. What an occasion. And I think we brought some California sunshine for you. Somebody said they ordered <laughs> California. So um, it's a great day. We're going we're to be doing the groundbreaking for the Bloom Energy Manufacturing Center here in Delaware. And I want to talk to you about three simple things. Why the state of Delaware? Why Bloom Energy? And why this marriage between Bloom Energy and the state of Delaware? Well, as you would expect, when we, when we started looking for building a factory in the East Coast, and why did we start thinking about building a factory in the East Coast? It was because we had started in California with Fortune 500 customers with whom we, we had experimented our systems. They were very happy with their experience. They bought more. And they said, now we want you to grow and grow with us in the markets where we are. And the next obvious market for many of those customers and new customers who were asking us to come congregated in the northeast part of the country. So we were looking to build a factory. And as you can imagine, Several states were very interested in this and came and talked to us. So you would ask me then, what was the reason that we picked Delaware? Well, there are actually 900,000 reasons. <laughs> and the 900,000 reasons are the Delawareans. You, as a community, as a state, I can call you a community. You're a small state that it all bonded together. <laughs> uh, you, as a, uh, you as a state uh, have this great workforce, very well educated, an ethic for quality, and a rich heritage of manufacturing. You have a very business-friendly climate. But you also, the 900,000 Delawareans, have the wisdom to elect leaders time after time who have the vision and who have the dedication to give back to the state. That impressed us tremendously because we saw that in action. Your first citizen, Jack Markell, without Governor Markell, we wouldn't be here today. Bloom Energy will not be here today without your governor. And why? It was very simple. From the very first meeting we had with him, it was a no-nonsense meeting about saying, you want to be here in this state, uh, in this part of the world, and if I can convince you this is the best place to come, will you come? The answer is yes. Then. The next thing was, well, let us make this the best place for you to come. Tell us what it will take. And it was a can-do attitude. It was political entrepreneurship. Most importantly, it was also the integrity of the transaction. We could pick up the phone and talk to each other at any point in time, and we knew exactly where we stood. And there were no games. And that ability to connect with people, it's always about people. You know, the 900,000 reasons for the 900,000 people, the leaders that they pick. The leader is a person. For us, as a culture, it's all about people. Then you follow that up with the General Assembly, 
and they're like leadership there, very supportive. You go and look at the congressional delegation, the two senators became good friends <laughs> by the time this was going on. Uh, again, same alignment is what we saw. We saw that in the PSC commissioners. We saw that in the utility. And then something very important that we look for, who is training the next generation of workforce? It's not just about today. It's about a long-term view. And President Harker came out to visit Bloom, and out here was working very hard and his vision for what he's building and what he's trying to do to get that next generation of Delawareans even better than the existing generation, which is what we all aspire for. That combination to us, that teamwork, resonated with our culture. And for us, we said, we have to build the Bloom Energy Manufacturing Center here in Delaware. So, governor, leaders, thank you very much. So the 900,000 people are the reason why we're in Delaware. Why did we build Bloom Energy? Well, it's a 9 billion people. It's a 9 billion reasons. By 2050, the world will be about 9 billion people. And the 9 billion people have the right to aspire for the same things that we all aspire for. Better economy, better growth, and energy is a fundamental enabler of all that. And when we started the company, the mission was very simple. The mission was to find a way to provide clean, reliable energy in an accessible and affordable way to all 9 billion people on the planet. Simple mission, right? Well, one can simply ask, what gives a really small company, growing fast, but a really small company. The audacity to dream that way, is it hallucination? Well, the answer actually is the strength, the courage, the boldness comes from our people. Bloom, there's not a single Bloom employee, and there's some of them here, you can go talk to them. Not a single Bloom employee who thinks we will not do this. It's about how soon, how fast. We believe in that. Every, every person who wears a Bloom badge believes that they are working for Bloom Energy because they're on a mission. It happens to be a job. They're proud to wear the Bloom Energy badge and have Bloom as an employer because they're part of a mission, part of something a lot bigger than themselves. And they understand it's teamwork. It's people working together. It's close communications. It is that culture that ultimately makes things happen. Yes, we have great technology. Yes, we have very good uh, uh, investors. Yes, we are in a good time to be doing this. But ultimately, it's the people. So why Bloom and Delaware? It's the values. You put people first, we put people first. And we want to see that when we build our factory here, together, the great people of Delaware and the employees we now have in Bloom and employees we will call employees of Bloom very soon out here, together are part of this mission to change what we need to do. So that's why we are here and we're proud to be here. We also understand there's an obligation and a responsibility on our part. You have been very generous in welcoming us here to the state. And you welcomed us with a lot of expectations. That expectations puts the onus and the responsibility on us. And we take that very seriously. It is about creating win-win situations. It is about creating the economic growth out here with good jobs. And a way where the job can do good and make good. And set an example for how companies and industries need to be built. We are looking forward to building this dream and mission out here with each one of your help. And we are very thankful for that. We have here two other entities that I want to acknowledge. Uh, any company can dream 
and it'll, it'll, be, it'll stay the hallucination and not the execution even if you execute, unless there are customers who really want what you, what you built. And we're proud to have customers who are household names, who are repeat customers, and we have created that. Here, we're just sampling a few new uh, who you will see, the, these are champions of their industry. They are the energy and sustainability experts within their very large companies. And we have asked them to spend a little bit of their time, and they've been gracious to come here to this occasion to talk to you all about what does Bloom mean to them as a customer. That's an important thing. And we want to thank our customers profusely because any company is not going to exist without its customer. Thank you for being here. There is one other group uh, that we are very grateful for at Bloom, and the state of Delaware will be watching you and courting you, I'm sure. And these are our supply chain partners. I see several of our supply chain partners out here in the audience. Welcome. And they are here to come celebrate with us this occasion. And uh, uh, without them supplying quality parts to us, we can't be building what we need to build. And they're all here to explore and look at this wonderful opportunity of space. As I can see, I think, I think you can negotiate some land and space out here if you want to create some jobs. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm sure the state officials will be looking for you uh, right after this event. <laughs> so uh, it is my distinct honor now uh, to introduce. Oh, I can't introduce him to you. He is your former governor and your senior senator, a leading voice in this nation for innovation, for clean energy, for American jobs, and Delaware first, Senator Carper. Thank you very much. As KR knows, uh, before I came to Delaware in uh, 1973, I had been a naval flight officer at Moffett Field Naval Air Station, just south of San Francisco. And just before I uh, packed up my Volkswagen Carmen Ghia to make the long drive <laughs> from California to uh, Newark, Delaware, I took it to the uh, hobby shop. Uh, at the Naval Air Station. Those of you who served in the military know that sometimes we have hobby shops for guys and gals who work on their cars or their bicycles or whatever. And I took uh, my Volkswagen car gear to the hobby shop just to check on some things to make sure it was ready for the, uh, for the trip. And they loaded up and came this way. About seven or eight years ago, uh, Moffett Field is no longer a Naval Air Station. But the building that was a hobby shop uh, was still there. And I just want to ask, uh, Carol, would you just tell people one of the places that uh, the Bloom Energy got its start out in California? Would you just mention what that location was? That same hobby shop was, <laughs> was, was the garage that was given to me for free by NASA for five years. And if you're in Silicon Valley, you know what that means. Free rent is you know, phenomenal. Uh, and that's where we got started. So that's the garage where Bloom got started. Thank Love you. it. Okay, I drove here and I got an MBA up the road here at the university and a year after that, I'd been here less than three years, I got to run for state treasurer, job that our governor later held. Nobody wanted to run, that's how I, I got to, uh, to run. And uh, I drove my Volkswagen Carmen Ghia over here to this Chrysler plant, I hit it. <laughs> So nobody at work here would know I was driving a, a Volkswagen car in gear. <laughs> but the same car that I tuned up in that hobby shop brought me here and gave me a chance to, uh, to seek some votes. And the day that I was here, the first day I campaigned, there was a guy named John D. Kelly who was here. And uh, many of you uh, know John D. Kelly. He, he was our sheriff. He's our profound here. And Chris knows he was, did all kinds of uh, things here. Beloved, funny guy, Kellen's Logie ho Logan House. And uh, he would stand at one of the Chrysler gates, and I'd stand with him. He was hard to compete with. And I would have these brochures I'd hand out about, all about why I would be a great state treasurer and pictures and you know, about my education and so forth. He would give people a business card. 
and it would just say, vote for me, I need the job. <laughs> People have been coming here thinking about jobs for a long time. And for over 50 years, they came here to build uh, all kinds of cars and trucks and vans. And the Durango, you'd be happy to know, Durangos are going like uh, hotcakes these days. and They're doing well. It's a sad, sad thing that they're not uh, being built uh, here. But uh, we saw Ad in the, the wonderful video up here a little bit ago, Albert, Albert Einstein. And one of the things that Einstein used to say, as Chris Coons has told me many times, in adversity lies opportunity. And when we lost the Chrysler plant here, the University of Delaware said, we'd like to buy this, uh, this land, we'd like to buy it and, and see what we could do with it, to maybe create an incubator, a space that would be a nurturing environment for job creation, job preservation. And uh, KR and the governor uh, got hooked up, and uh, Chris and I got a little bit involved, and John Carney as well, and uh, said uh, this could be uh, just a great way to kick off this uh, star, uh, star campus. And, and I just want to say uh, to the, uh, the vision that our uh, president, Pat Harker has shown and continues to show to the incredible, incredible dogged tenacity that, uh, that our governor shows in pursuing all kinds of economic opportunities. To our legislature who've been uh, terrific in supporting, where's Gary? Gary Stockbridge, you know, the, a big part of the nurturing environment here is, uh, is, goes beyond government. It's the kind of nurturing environment that you've been very much and your folks at uh, DPNL have been very much in part of. I don't know if we have anybody here from the Public Utility Commission, but they are a critical factor in this as, as well. It's probably going to be strange for what I'm going to say right now, but government does not create jobs. Government does not create jobs. What our, our job, a major job of ours, is to create a nurturing environment for job creation and job preservation. That's what we do. It includes world-class workforce. It includes uh, uh, the, uh, if you will, a nurturing environment that includes a friendship, a friendly welcome, and a warm embrace and just a dogged persistence, a dogged pursuit in some, some cases. It includes uh, terrific uh, infrastructure, and we know the mayor over here knows that we're working, Chris and I and John are, are working with the university to try to create a transit hub right here where our postage stamp of a train station exists uh, today, and we appreciate the support and help from uh, Shailene Bott and the folks at, uh, at DOT as, as, as well. Tax structure, all that common sense regulation, it's all and really the part that uh, DPNL plays is just hugely helpful as, as well. I'll close, uh, close with this if I can. We had a guy named uh, Gene Sperling who came by and had uh, lunch with uh, Chris and me. He's the president's uh, chief uh, economic advisor these days. He used to work for Bill, Bill Clinton. And he talked about manufacturing jobs. And he said a lot of people in this country think, well, manufacturing jobs are passe. And uh, what we want to be is a service economy, an information economy, and, and on and on and on. Uh-uh. We want to be a service economy. We want to be an information. We want financial services. We want legal services. We want all of that but we want to build things in this state. We want to build things. We want to grow things in the state. We want to build and grow things in the state that people in other countries will want to buy. And the folks in this country will want to buy as well. And one of the things we all know that we need is we need energy. And we don't need energy that pollutes and fouls our air and makes us sick. We need energy that, uh, that keeps us well and energy that helps provide jobs while providing energy at the same, uh, the same time. It all kind of works together, doesn't it? This all works together. And for those uh, who uh, worked in, uh, in this huge expanse uh, for 50, 60 years, building those cars, trucks, and vans, they made us proud. I've got a hunch, uh, KR, that you and, and your team are going to make everybody here who believed in this project, who believes in your company, who believes in you, uh, all the prouder. Good luck. God bless you. Thanks so much. And I think I get to introduce uh, my, uh, my wingman, uh, my good friend. Uh, KR, I, I don't know what it's like in other states. Uh, well, actually, I do. In other states, the senators rarely talk to their governors. Across the uh, Delaware River in New Jersey, Frank Lautenberg, the, the uh, senior senator over there, has talked to his governor one time in two years, and I don't think it was pleasant. <laughs> we talk to our governor about every other day. And John and Chris and I are like the three amigos. We are, uh, and when it was Mike, Mike Castle, who is Mike? Where's Mike Castle? Mike, stand up and take a bow. Mike Castle, former governor, former congressman. Whether the governor was Carper, or DuPont, or Castle, or, or uh, Markel, we worked together. We built that nurturing environment. And uh, I love uh, serving with Michael, love to serve with Michael, and still do uh, a lot of fun things together. 
But the guy that's uh, my, my, uh, my wingman these days, and Gray, who's doing a terrific, terrific job in the United States Senate, our new senator, his name is Chris Coons. Chris, would you come forward, please? Thank you. Thank you, Senator Carper. As <clears throat> is clear from the microphones, I come up short every time. <laughs> I try to stand as tall as you in our state and in our country. You have been a remarkable role model and leader. KR has a secret. KR has a secret that even till this moment, he will not reveal to me. What is the catalyst? Well, I'll start. What is a catalyst? As the only chemist in the Congress, I like to play a little bit at being a scientist. A catalyst is something we all know a little bit about. The Durangos that used to roll off the line here, Jim, had catalytic converters in them, right? And a catalyst is something that brings things together and facilitates a reaction. It makes it happen faster. It, ha it, it makes it happen cheaper. It, it reduces the energy required to make it happen. A catalytic converter takes things and changes them, but is not taken up by the reaction. And catalysis is the black magic of chemistry. The science, the principles behind fuel cells have been known more than a century. As President Harker said, back when the Morrill Act was being passed, back when land-grant universities were starting in this country, the Patent Office was reviewing and granting the very first patent for fuel cells. As a member of the Energy Committee, we hear all too often about the challenges of energy for our country and for our world and how we've got this iron triangle in energy. It can be clean, it can be safe, it can be cheap. It can be two out of three. It can never be all three. If it's clean, if it's safe, it's incredibly expensive. If it is clean and it's cheap, it's not particularly safe. This triangle has dominated much of energy policy for a long time. And always off on the horizon, fuel cells as something invented more than a century ago that folks hoped would someday achieve its potential. But as Joe Rigby can tell you, Delmarva had a solid oxide fuel cell here 25, 30 years ago. United Technologies has taken something almost exactly like this solid oxide fuel cell, put it in submarines under the ocean, put it in Skylab up in the skies, has spent huge amounts of money. It was incredibly expensive, but it worked. Fuel cells are well-known, long-established technology. So what's the difference? The catalyst. There is a catalyst in that humming box that has solved a century-old challenge. How do you make solid oxide fuel cells work in a way that is safe, that is clean, and is affordable? And someone has the answer to that question. And he won't tell me what the catalyst is. <laughs> I went out to California, had an amazing visit to their manufacturing plant, walked around, kept sort of trying to take little pieces, sort of peeking behind curtains, just dying to find out what the catalyst is. But you know what? In his introduction, in his acceptance of the open arm greeting of our community, he's really told us what the catalyst is. The catalyst that has brought this together today and made it work, the catalyst that reduced the reaction coordinates that made it possible more cheaply, more efficiently, more inexpensively for this groundbreaking to happen here is Governor Markell. It is somebody who, by his leadership and vision, pulled together an amazing cabinet between Alan Levin and Colin O'Meara and all the folks in there, got them, pulled them together and got them to work together in the way, historically, they didn't. Or is it? Is it Speaker Gilligan and, and Senator DeLuca and their ability to pull together a restive and difficult legislature that works here so much better than the one that Senator Carper and I are a part of each and every day? Or are they the catalyst that made it work, that brought an answer? Is it the Public Service Commission? Is it the innovators here at the university? Is it the educators who create a workforce at Newark and Glasgow, at Dell Tech and UD? Is it the leadership of President Harker of the university or Mark Bartow, the Senior Vice Provost for Research, is it any of these one elements? Is it the vision of the university and having bought this great space? Every day as I rode south on the train and watched one more piece of that great Chrysler plant come down, it tore at my heart. 
thinking about standing at these gates first thing in the morning or last thing at night as hundreds of men walked in and out, men and women, walked in and out of a manufacturing facility that had some of the best labor management relations in the country, some of the best productivity in the country, a place where innovation and manufacturing were in right relationship, where the workforce delivered great products and where they brought home to their families a great quality of life. What an amazing thing that right here on this spot, we had innovation and manufacturing in the right relationship. And as I rode south every day and saw those cranes tearing it down, I worried deeply. Today, we see a different sort of crane, a different sort of shuttle, shovel dig into this earth and open up the potential of a blooming of a whole new relationship. One where once again, we say that made in America, manufactured in Delaware, is something that we value, that we are willing to come together and fight for, that we think can put food on the table, can put benefits and retirement and a real quality of life within reach for hundreds and hundreds of our fellow citizens and yet keep driving. Invention, innovation, and advances that, as KR said, will make a difference for the whole world. Think about it. It's all because of a catalyst. It's all because of the catalysis going on in that box right out there. It's all because of the catalysis driven by these legislative leaders, these business leaders, this great leader of our state, and this great leader of this university. In the end, I don't know exactly what the catalyst is in that box, but I know what the catalyst is in this room. And it is the values and the willingness to come together and to find real solutions of the people of Delaware. I don't know what it is, but I know how it works. And just after me, you will hear a whole panel of customers who won't tell you what the catalyst is, but they'll tell you that the proof is in the pudding, or maybe in this case, in the humming, in these small, silent, gray boxes that sit outside their world-class manufacturing facilities and deliver clean, safe, and efficient power for our future. For being the catalyst, Governor Markell, for being the catalyst, the people of Delaware, thank you so much for making this future possible. I believe it now falls to me to introduce a real chemist, Senior Vice Provost for Research, Professor Mark Bartow. Thank you, Senator Coons. Uh, you know, for many years at the university, we've taught a course in the chemistry of catalytic processes and taught it not just on campus, but to companies like DuPont and Dow and Exxon and Alcoa. And since I've been in the university administration, I haven't had the opportunity to teach that course, but I think I found my replacement. <laughs> uh, you've heard today about the innovation ecosystem that we hope to create on this star campus of the University of Delaware. But for the next few minutes of, of the program, uh, we'd like to talk to you about another ecosystem, and that's the energy ecosystem. And the key driver of that ecosystem that's been created here with, with Bloom Energy are the customers that are adopting the technology that Bloom has pioneered and is manufacturing. Uh, and we have next a, a panel of some of the customers who will uh, describe that to you. It's a diverse group. It includes a gas utility, an electric utility, uh, one of the world's leading manufacturers of building material systems, and the world's largest communications company. So I'm going to ask the, the panel members to come forward uh, as I call them up uh, and uh, take seats on, on the, the, the dais. Uh, the first is Gary Stockbridge, who's the president of Delmarva Power. Next is Gautam Chandra, who's the vice president for business development, strategy, business process outsourcing, and non-utility operations for WGL Holdings and Washington Gas. <laughs> Next is Frank O'Brien Bernini, who is the Chief Sustainability Officer for Owens Corning. <laughs> and finally, John Schinter, the Director of Energy for AT&T.
So I'm not sure the mics came with instructions, but I suspect you've all done this before. <laughs> I'm going to, to, to uh, start with Gary Stockbridge. Um, the, the project that Delmarva is doing with Bloom is the largest fuel cell project in the United States. As you continue to be at the forefront of finding innovative ways to serve your customers, could you talk about how this technology will help meet those needs? Um, let me talk about three important goals we have at the company, and, and, and we get into our best relationships with other businesses when we align our goals with theirs. Uh, one of our first goals that our customers expect from us is to keep the lights on 24 hours a day, seven days a week, every day of the year. Uh, and so the first thing we looked at when we went out and visited with Bloom uh, was reliability. And, and I can tell you from the statistics, these are extremely reliable units. Uh, they're base load units, they're gonna be running 24 by seven, uh, but more important than the fact that, that statistics told me that they're reliable, uh, when we went out and met with the Bloom team, uh, we met with customers, we met with uh, folks all the way up and down the factory line, all the way up into the executive ranks. Uh, and one of the things that became apparent was that when, when a customer has a problem, everybody is focused on that problem. So what we heard that was important to us was if, if there's going to be a problem, and there seldom is, when there is, everybody in this company is going to be focused on it. So that was important to us. Uh, the second uh, goal that we're focused on quite a bit, and, and this state is in the forefront, uh, thanks to the governor's efforts and thanks to the General Assembly, is around renewable and clean energy. Uh, about 25% of our supply by the year 2025 has to be renewable or clean. And this project will help us make significant inroads uh, into hitting that goal. And it'll diversify our portfolio in a way, as many of you know, solar, wind, you know, only good when the wind's blowing when the sun's out, so they have an intermittent nature to them that sometimes can be very challenging to our infrastructure. But these units, 24 by 7, add a great diversity to our portfolio, and they're always on. They're more of a help to our system than a challenge to our system. Uh, and then third and most important is we always have to be looking out for our customers and what impact this is going to have to our customers. Uh, and so what we have found in our relationship and our eventual contract, this is one of the few contracts we have it's going to be stable, and it actually goes down over time. Almost all of our contracts are either flat or increasing over time, uh, and especially the energy market in general is going up. But when we look at this contract, it'll actually go down over time, uh, and it'll be stable over time, which is something that our customers demand. So those are three very important goals for us and three ways that we found a perfect match with Bloom. Thanks. You mentioned several different clean energy technologies that have different suitability for uh, distributed power applications, and I wonder how uh, the, the uh, distributed generation model sort of tr or transforms your business model. Yeah, it's, 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 uh, it, let me answer that in two ways. First, um, the way we're going to be using these units, I think, will prove that the Bloom cells can operate either at a customer level, uh, whether it's an individual unit like this, uh, or it can operate where we're going to have 15 of these probably 10 minutes from here at our Brookside location. Uh, in fact, I hear that unit is actually going there, so anybody that's looking at that unit, don't scratch it, don't bump it, don't kick <laughs> it. <laughs> I think that's ours, so I want to make sure it looks as good when it gets out to the site. Or 135 of these units sitting out at our uh, Red Line substation. So, it, you know, ev as you can see, a tremendous amount of flexibility all the way from the customer to the grid. Uh, and so for us, that flexibility is important. But, but I have to say, you know, we want to be on the forefront of understanding what distributed generation means to us, especially with this kind of a unit. And that's part of what this relationship is about, working with the university, working with Bloom, working with our company and others in the industry. We're hoping to learn a lot about how this can help in a distributed generation fashion. Because at the end of the day, we just want to benefit our customers. It doesn't ma matter whether it's a huge power plant or whether it's a single Bloom fuel cell unit. If it can bring a benefit, we want to learn about it and be on the forefront. Great, thank you. Let me turn now to Gotham Chandra. Uh, you represent a natural gas provider, so you probably have a, a slightly different perspective on, uh, 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 than the typical energy user. Uh, what's the outlook for natural gas and, and what role do you see for uh, efficient distributed energy generation? Mark, thanks for uh, having me here and it, it's truly a great pleasure for me to be here today representing WGL Holdings and Washington Gas as the first installed East Coast customer for Bloom, uh, Bloom Energy. We've been following the company for a long time. We recently completed the, uh, the construction of our LEED Gold Certified Operating Center in Springfield, Springfield Virginia and we have a 
bloom salve operating there. And Gary, we already have our bloom salve, so I don't have to arm wrestle you for this one. Uh, but, but as we look at our um, strategy as a company, we see a lot of alignment with, with bloom. Uh, we, uh, our vision statement, our corporate vision statement is to be the leading provider of clean and efficient energy solutions uh, that add value for all of our stakeholders. And as part of making that vision real, and to be able to walk our talk, we actually earlier this year rolled out uh, uh, GHG or greenhouse gas uh, goal to reduce our facility emissions by 70% by 2020. And the bloom cell is a big, uh, big component of that. Uh, the installed bloom cell that we have in Springfield, it's supplying about 35% of the power for the facility and it's reducing our carbon emissions by about 40% from uh, what's, uh, what we would be emitting if we were sourcing the electricity from the grid. Uh, it's also uh, operating ahead of uh, uh, plants, so it's actually operating above rated capacity. So that's, that's another uh, very positive. Uh, but beyond just our, uh, our own um, utilization of bloom within our facilities, we've long been as a corporation proponents of natural gas. The end use of natural gas is the most economical and environmentally efficient way to use the fuel. And the world is finally starting to catch up to that. If you think about the fact that we're sitting here today about 100 miles away from what's considered the, the Saudi Arabia of natural gas with the, with the shale gas that's, that's available. When you combine that uh, with the unquestioned reliability of the natural gas distribution system in the face of storms, whether they're hurricanes, ice storms, et cetera, when you, when you put those two, two together uh, using technology like Bloom, uh, it's a no-brainer. We're starting to see a lot of uh, interest in our customers in, in technology such as, uh, such as Bloom, and we look forward to uh, to taking Bloom to our customers over the next few years. Great, thank you. Let me turn now to Frank uh, O'Brien Bernini from Owens Corning, which has uh, deep roots as a, a manufacturing organization. Uh, can you tell us about some of the, the energy challenges for a manufacturer? Sure, thanks a lot, and thanks for uh, having me here today. Uh, Owens Corning is about a $5 billion company. We uh, manufacture products for our customers all around the world. Um, and we, we have a core business strategy that is our sustainability strategy. And in that strategy, there's three key elements, um, and they overlap a lot. And the first one is around greening our operations, which is a footprint reduction goal for our operations. We set uh, very tough goals in 2002 uh, to reduce our uh, emissions and resources that we use across our operations. And inside that was a 2012, so a 10-year goal off of 2002 to reduce our greenhouse gas footprint by 30%. Um, and we've nearly met that now. We will by the end of this year. And now we set another 2020 goal uh, for another 20% reduction. So, th so that's the greening our operations part, and that's a global goal. Um, the second one is around greening our products, and there's a large overlap as you reduce the energy that it takes to make your products, you increase the relative greenness of those products. Um, and then the third area is collaborations that we have with our customers and suppliers uh, to accelerate energy efficiency and renewables in the built environment. So all three of those sort of overlap. So how does this come, come into the, the whole Bloom relationship? Well, as you can imagine, as we've worked energy efficiency in our own operations since 2002 in a very distinct way to drive our energy consumption down and greenhouse gas, we've played down a lot of the energy efficiency opportunities in our manufacturing operations. And we have begun several years ago to look at cleaner fuel opportunities, opportunities to fuel switch from coal-fired power uh, to natural gas power in one form or another. And when we looked at the opportunity to fuel switch or to bring fuel cells, distributed fuel cells on site to our manufacturing facilities, it gave us another about 30, just about 30% reduction in greenhouse gas, depending on the, the grid uh, that, that was supplying that plant. So it was a very interesting story and compelling story relative to uh, footprint reduction for our manufacturing. And then there, uh, there was a kicker in this, and that is all of our facilities are continuous operations facilities. And if you have a interruption in the electrical supply, that causes a problem, a manufacturing problem, because mission critical uh, parts of the process are, are running on electrical power. And the Bloom servers gave us an opportunity to put in a, a, 
uh, undisrupted power supply for those mission critical uh, operations, which include both manufacturing operations and our emissions control devices. So this gave us an opportunity to um, improve our manufacturing operations with this uninterruptible supply and to reduce our base uh, footprint for the operation. So we're very interested in this technology and are looking to deploy it across uh, several of our facilities. Great, thank you. Let me turn now to John Schinter from at and I, I suspect that most people with one of these gizmos in their pockets don't really think about the consequences that the increased power and sophistication has uh, in terms of, of energy demand. So can you talk a, a little bit about uh, the, the impact of, of increased network demand and how you meet that in a sustainable and, and reliable way? You bet. Thank you, Professor. <clears throat> well, there's no question that everybody in the room would, uh, would really like to continue to have a very reliable source of telecommunications and, and information uh, uh, transfer. And what I would say is it's very exciting to be here. This is a great time in the industry. It's, a, it's really a great time for, uh, um, for Delaware. And it, it, it's really a part that AT&T has played a big role in. Uh, reliability is probably the biggest thing that we have on the table in terms of being able to transfer data across our network. Um, for example, um, it goes hand in hand. Uh, whenever you have a data transfer increase across the, you know, across the, uh, uh, the network, you of course have a corresponding increase in energy use. And what we're looking to do is to make sure that we grow in a very efficient way. So for example, last year, we had a target to, uh, to improve our energy use per terabyte of data transfer by about 16%. And we actually achieved that goal. We actually uh, dropped, uh, we actually increased it by 16.6% and uh, dropped down to 14, uh, 415 uh, kilowatt hours per terabyte of information. So what we're looking for is to find a very clean, reliable source of energy. Uh, and as we go on, you realize that this technology offers us to not only improve our reliability, but it has, very, it has no rotating parts. Uh, it has very little maintenance associated with it over time. And it allows us to actually introduce a, uh, let's call it an alternative way to have on-site power generation. Let's face it, there's a lot of disruption that's associated um, with transmission and distribution of power out to the sites. This allows us to have actually on-site generation in itself. And uh, what I could say is that it's very clean. Um, we actually have now installed uh, seven and a half megawatts of power using this technology at 11 sites uh, within AT&T. And it's very exciting. Uh, we're certainly looking at it um, to, to expand out even further, but clearly reliability is the key reason we're doing this. And uh, for all the, the other uh, colleagues uh, here that we're talking about, the environmental impacts as well, substantial reductions in the emissions associated with the technology. So it's, it's really been a great path for us, and we're pretty excited about it as well. Great. Thank you very much. Please join me in thanking all of the, the panelists this morning. Now, my pleasure to introduce Gary Convis. So, Governor, you and your team, this is why we're here. And you've talked, uh, we've, we've talked about the uh, technology. You've heard from our customers. If it was easy to build this kind of technology, everybody would be doing it. So what we're here to do is to kick off and groundbreak a celebration that is really special because this is not easy to do. And it takes hundreds of talented and dedicated people, not only in our company, but in our supply base and uh, people around the world have made this day possible. So that's why we're here to celebrate and celebrate creating great jobs for the men and women here in Delaware. Um, I'm an auto guy. This, uh, I spent over 43 years making cars, very similar to Jim. and. Um, this kind of business gets in your blood, in your heart. And I could really relate to what you said about seeing this disappear. Um, I was involved in, uh, in the traditional auto environment for over 20 years with Ford and General Motors. And then in 1984, I was privileged to have the opportunity to join Toyota in their startup out in California. 
and I spent the next 23 years fortunately adding jobs, good American jobs, around in many different states in our country. And in fact, it would, during my time, it was over 25,000 of those jobs that were created. And you know, we used to think about uh, the residual jobs that also supported that work were about seven to one. So those are very important community jobs that really support many things in our country today. And in my small way, I see Bloom's opportunity to be the same thing. So we're here today to break ground on this great site. We're gonna build, first of all, about a 200,000 square foot facility. And the kind of jobs we're gonna create here are clean, enjoyable, efficient, and the kind of environment they're going to work in is the same thing. So we're very, very excited about this. And I wanna just take a second to also recommend or uh, recognize the important contributions that our supply chain people uh, provide for us, really around the world. Places like Japan, Germany, but also Canada, Michigan, Indiana, Illinois, right here in the home state of Delaware. We expect to grow here and we expect to provide opportunities for our supply chain to be close by. That's what we want, that's what I envision we will have here. So uh, also, our customers. Without you, we would not be here. And uh, quite frankly, the, uh, the proof in the pudding is that so many of our customers are repeat customers. They're coming back and saying, this stuff really works. The secret sauce is very efficient, very dependable. And KR, I don't know how you created it, you and the team. And I gotta tell you, if you ever get out to Sunnyvale, you need to come see us. We have a remarkable group of engineers that toil tirelessly every day to make this work. And we also have several hundred men and women who make this wonderful product right here. And one of the real things that brought me uh, to Bloom, it's reliable, it runs, it reports to work every day. We maintain it and we tend to keep that going. So when people invest their hard-earned earnings in the Bloom's um, solution, we know that you need a solution, that we have the solution, and now in Delaware, we need the help of the men and women in this room and outside of this room to help us build this wonderful factory we're gonna put right here. And to help us do that, Kara asked me to go out and find the, the best manufacturing guy I could find in my network of don't want to tell you how many years, but uh, that was a big task. Fortunately, in my network, I reached out to find the best. The best is Barry Sharp, and he is your new plant manager of the Delaware plant that'll be here about a year from now. He and his family will move here to Delaware and be a local support, and a guy that you will really be, um, grow to appreciate and enjoy. He not only is a manufacturing expert, but he is an, a wonderful human being, which you will find and he'll fit in just like a glove. If you would, please welcome Barry Sharp. Thank you. So I'm over here. So thank you, Gary. Very, very gracious introduction. I appreciate that. Um, so I'm very happy to be here today. And, uh, and I'm happy to be here in Delaware. And, and I'll tell you, every time I come here, I feel more welcome and I feel more at home. And um, I'm anxious to move a family here. And I'm anxious to live here and, and uh, be a part of this community. You know, Governor Markell created a, uh, a phrase of calling me the, the Bloom Delaware employee number one. And, and uh, I'll, I'll wear that badge with honor and, until the day that I can bring hundreds more here next year. And, uh, and, and we all look forward to that day. And, and today we're making a, uh, a foundation of, of, of doing a groundbreaking for this factory that will, will stand right here behind us. So the Bloom Energy Manufacturing Center in Delaware, it, it will be a, a clean, lean, advanced, high-tech facility. We intend to 
to blend the culture of, of Bloom Energy and, and the culture of the Delaware community together. The, um, in fact, I, I, I see it as a community within a community. Our, our manufacturing style and, and management style will be one that, that promotes a learning process, creating leaders at all, leaders at all levels and creating an opportunity that, um, that has a culture and every person in the, in the company is driven to create the highest quality and the lowest cost in, in every day using every member's input into the process. And we do this in a continuous improvement manner day after day after day with everyone's involvement, standing side by side without, without so much hierarchy but much more within teamwork. We also see that 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 community within a community is a manner of encouraging our team members to, to go into the community and, and use their, their skills. What we, what we teach and what we learn in the form of leadership and in the form of problem solving, we hope to be manifested within the community and in the organizations and the nonprofits and, and the different ways that we can contribute back to the community within Delaware. So as a baseline, we will use the Bloom production system uh, it, it, it teaches a lean process uh, concepts and tools foundation that, that Gary and I learned within the Toyota production system. And it manifests itself in a way that, that it becomes the baseline of, of everything we do to develop the factory and to develop the, the uh, workforce. So as we, as we teach that, we will create um, uh, human development processes that allow every person to proceed to be the best that they can be and to have a continuous learning process. And we, um, we believe that with that, we can grow our leaders from within. And we intend to grow the leaders from within as we develop here. We believe that's the best way for the workforce. We believe it's the best way for the community and the best way for Bloom. So we expect to create this environment that, uh, that fosters a workforce unsurpassed in quality. We expect to be a model of the best manufacturing in America. And we, we expect to be a, a workforce and a factory that Delaware is proud of. So as a result, we are partnering with the University of Delaware College of Engineering and the Lerner College of Business and Economics to to create a lean thinking process industry training program and university curriculum. And okay. so David Weir, who is um, director of the Office of Economic Innovation and, and Partnerships and, and, and a long-term employee locally with, uh, with DuPont, um, is, is working with me to help build a world-class organization on this site that would then serve as a model to promote the development of 21st century manufacturing management systems that would then influence all of the state and hopefully all of the region. And I'm really excited about this project and I think we're really gonna be able to make some, some heavy roads and in, in influence in the entire area as we create a model right here on this site. And then, to assist the delivery of the 21st century innovation to the world, we've, we've looked at a, at a teamwork effort with DuPont Experimental Laboratories. Um, DuPont, this is a company that's been creating innovation to the world since the 19th century from right here in Delaware. And so John Walker is the, uh, is the business development manager for du DuPont Sustainable Systems. He's working with me to create this science dream team, a, a team mixed with scientists from Bloom and, and with Delaware, and, and we believe that it will pay back huge dividends to our mission to create clean, reliable, affordable energy for the world. And, and this has an opportunity for Delaware in itself to make a stake in that, in that mission. And, and we're very happy about those two relationships we've developed so far, and we expect them to, uh, to promote more developments within our organization, within the community. As I said before, I'm very happy to be here. 
I hope to have given you some idea how we plan to, to operate and how we plan to run this organization. As was mentioned many times uh, today, it's about the people. And we intend for this plant back here to be about the people. And, uh, and, and we intend to, at the same time that we can promote the people, we can develop a system that, that creates world-class manufacturing that everyone will be able to recognize right here. So with, with going to work on uh, how are we going to develop the manufacturing right here on this site, I'd like to introduce someone that did some manufacturing right here on this site for quite some time. So Jim, Jim Wolf is the president and CEO of Delaware State Chamber of Commerce. Uh, has been said two or three times today, 39 years with, uh, with Chrysler, 12 years as a uh, plant manager right here on this site. And, uh, and I've had time to spend with, uh, with Jim a few weeks ago. And I know he's gonna be an incredible asset to Bloom and to myself here in, in, uh, in developing roots within Delaware. And so I'd like to introduce Jim, if you could say some words, please. Thank you, Barry, for inviting me, and uh, KR, it's great to see you again, and welcome to Delaware. It really is bittersweet for me to be here today. Uh, the Newark Assembly Plant has really been a great uh, facility. It's a site that has great heritage, and this will be our third phase of manufacturing. We actually built, for those of you who don't know, in 1952, it was a patent tank plant for the uh, Korean conflict, and then in 1957, it was converted over to car manufacturing. And it actually built six million cars here at this facility before we converted it to a truck facility and then built over a million Durangos. And uh, as Barry mentioned, I was here uh, 17 years of my 39 and a half and one month short of 40 years uh, here at this facility, 12 as the site manager. And I was actually here in the, uh, in the 80s and I was here as the uh, operations manager for the second shift and also uh, as the quality control manager for the for the site and really got to love the people of Delaware and uh, wanted to come back here and when I had an opportunity I did in 1992 and uh, it's it really is the people and that's what really uh, breaks my heart when when I was driving by it was disheartening to see uh, the wreckers out front and to see the place uh, torn down JJ Johnson is here with us today he's a representative and he was my union president when I was there at the plant and so we worked together very well and that was the teamwork that was mentioned earlier just uh, uh, absolute we were away from Detroit away from the central office and able to do a lot of things that other locations couldn't do um, the best thing about this plant was the people or were the people the people uh, they were the best workforce and I worked in seven different assembly plants around the United States and Canada and uh, uh, every day I would talk to employees on the floor and try to help them and help solve problems and I really got to know the people here. I run into people now up and down the state who really are disheartened as well. But I've told them to keep hope that we're going to be seeing some jobs coming here, not only here but some other uh, locations. When you look at the size of this plant and what was here, it was a huge plant. It was the largest plant in the corporation that we had in Chrysler. It was 3.3 million square feet. That's about 70 football fields under one roof, just to give you a perspective, and the plant that's coming in is gonna be 200,000 square feet, about half the size of what the paint shop was, but it's gonna employ a lot of people, <laughs> so that's still great. Um, if it was a city in the state of Delaware, back when I uh, came here as a site manager in uh, 1992, uh, it would have been the seventh largest city in the state, and it won many awards for quality and the environment, and I really at this time want to thank all the employees that worked here at the plant and the great job that they did because it wasn't their fault that the plant closed. It was the economic times and the, uh, the, the closing and the Chrysler trouble that they have. So let's give them a hand for what they did over all the years. But now I'm pleased that we're getting life back into this site and this. And like I said, it was uh, the third generation. This will be the third generation of manufacturing coming back here. You think about the 57 years of manufacturing that it had. Look around the United States at the closed facilities, not just Chrysler, but Ford, General Motors, and some other plants are still empty. The ground is either flat, empty, or there's empty buildings there just uh, decaying and rotting. And when you look at where we're going, uh, one of the other things that I'm, that I'm pleased, pleased to bloom is chosen Delaware as its East Coast manufacturing hub. That's important. That is very important to us, and I am really pleased now, Gary talked about his, uh, 
his network and people that he meets and talks with and can check. I checked up both on Barry Sharp and Gary Convis. We got the right people here. And this is going to be a great teamwork that we have. They're highly regarded in the auto manufacturing world. They were two of Toyota's best, and I did check that out as well. Uh, when you look at Toyota, companies all over the world try to emulate them, try to follow in their footsteps, try to learn the Toyota production system. I tried that as well. In fact, I went to uh, Toyota in Japan many times and toured their assembly plants, especially the RAV4 plant. In fact, the 13 miles of conveyors that we had at this site, one quarter of them I converted to the Motomachi Toyota conveyor philosophy system, which actually stacked and ran uh, vehicles so that uh, you wouldn't lose as much production. And we became one of the most productive plants in the corporation, and I never told them the secret so that we could keep the plant running and keep it moving. But uh, uh, I'm just so pleased that they're here. And uh, if any of you uh, want to take a peek at a book about their uh, they're, what they've done with lean manufacturing, I suggest that you do that as well. Now, Delaware really has a highly skilled workforce. It's been mentioned a couple times, and I, I met them and worked with them uh, uh, day in, day out, uh, and that really was one of the keys to our success here with Chrysler. The thing I like the best about them, and you, the thing that you'll enjoy, is the attitude of the people, the can-do attitude and the wanting to learn and to do the things that are right to make things, things right. And, and we knew here at, uh, at Chrysler that our competition wasn't just Toyota or General Motors or, or Ford. Our competition was with Detroit because we had a lot of people in Detroit that wanted to see this place closed. And the only way to keep it open was through quality and quality work and quality in, uh, in making the process better and better and better. And they did exactly that. And when I uh, had an opportunity to go with the governor, he mentioned that I went to, uh, to Bloom in California. I did. Uh, unfortunately, I had a bad hip and couldn't go to the places that I wanted to go without a, an entourage, so I had to stay with the group. But I did get to walk and talk with the people there in the plant, and I really did like what I saw. They have a very, very sophisticated product that they're bringing out here, and we have the next generation of that product that's going to be coming here. And it will do well when they're able to refine the process and put that process under one roof. Right now, they're in several different locations right close by each other. But I like what I saw, and it is really going to be productive when you're able to, Barry, put this together here. I just can't wait to see it finished. Now, last year, I was invited to uh, join the governor and President Harker uh, to take a turn at the wrecking ball out here when they first started tearing down the building. I couldn't do that, so I declined. I didn't want to sit in there and see it start coming apart because of all of the memories that I had and all the stories. I could probably go on for hours and hours to tell you some of the stories that we had. But now I'm thrilled that we're going to have a high-tech manufacturing facility here partnered with the University of Delaware, and it'll be a great new industry and great incubator for our students here in Delaware. My best wishes for success, and thank you for inviting me to say a couple words. Today. Thank you very much, Jim. Thank you. Appreciate that handoff, per se. And the, um, so now we've come to the big moment, and, uh, and we're going we're gonna to talk about uh, what we've come here to celebrate. This is a moment that uh, the dreams and aspirations of many people in this room have, uh, have led up to where the concept meets reality. And, and um, I'm going I'm to ask uh, people to do the honors to come and, and unveil our, our banner and our sign, and this will symbolically be the, uh, the groundbreaking as, as we uh, stand on this concrete with very, very difficult times to put shovels in. And so, <laughs> so we're, so we're going to, we're going to unveil the banner. So I would, I would like to, uh, I'd like to ask that um, first president Harker, if you could uh, come, come and join me on this side, KR Street Art, come join me on that side. They will do the honors of doing the unveiling. And then if I could, uh, I could ask Senator Carper, and Senator Coombs to please join us here, uh, and Governor Markell and um, Gary Convis. We're going to ask Senator DeLuca to please come, and also Speaker Gilligan.
Okay, are we ready? So, if, uh, if you guys could help me, we're going to count down from 10 and, and unveil the <laughs> sign. 10, 9, 9 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Thank you. Thank you. you love. Great oh, <laughs> so congratulations, Bloom. Congratulations, Delaware. This sign will stand in front during the uh, production process of building our new factory, and, and we'll be proud to, to have it stand there along the way. So have a nice day. Thank you. Right. Just before, I'm very sorry. quickly, we, had, we just want to thank you for coming. Please don't leave without taking your gift courtesy of Bloom Energy. Thanks again. I add my thanks for coming. Let's see this plant rise. Let's build a new future here right on this site. Thanks again. Tell us on that Randy side. The next.